Hi everybody, um, my name is Matthew Lane and I am the Business Development Manager and Senior Project Engineer at, at, uh, at Cathy. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about risk management of subsea cables using a cable integrity risk assessment. So I will share my screen now and share the slides with you. Oh, I was already doing that. Um, we at Cathy are a global offshore geoscience and geotechnical engineering consultancy. We deliver geological, geospatial, geophysical and geotechnical engineering consultancy services to the offshore and nearshore projects for the global energy and marine infrastructure industries. We pride ourselves on our innovative solutions, enabling cost effective project delivery and managing seabed risk and solving technical challenges. Um, we've worked on over 75 gigawatts of offshore wind, 400 plus oil and gas projects and dealt with over 17,000 kilometres of cable. Uh, across our, our track record. Um, I am involved in the cables team at Cathy and dealing with uh, protection of, of cables is, is something we talk about regularly and the installation and I'm talking today about this risk management and the cable integrity risk assessment that we've been developing um, in Cathy in-house. So what we'll talk about today is a little bit of background on the CBRA, the Cable Burial Risk Assessment, which I imagine most people here will, will be have some awareness of. What we mean in terms of the CBRA, Cable Integrity Risk Assessment, and the development of that, the process that goes through, the exam, the risks um, that we are dealing with, and then what we can do in terms of remediation from there. So just to start on the CBRA and what that is, and most of most people here, as I say, will be will be relatively aware of it, and that is. Uh, a repeatable process to, to define a target depth of lowering, which is practically and economically achievable while providing adequate protection. And this is typically done in the sort of cable design phase about how we will protect the cables um, throughout its lifetime and what we will hope to bury it by um, and aim to bury it by to achieve that protection. This is through a framework, it's a repeatable process, um, and it uses probabilistic approaches and other information uh, for, the, for the hazards there. And this is the typical process that we work through in terms of the zebra. So we'll, we'll, the cable routing will, will occur, we will collate and appraise the data, the we will assess the seabed conditions, we will do a hazard assessment, that probabilistic assessment to make a, a quantitative approach, and then that will specify the barrier requirements. And these are things that are defined by um, Carbon Trust, um, this, the guidelines, and this is the sort of development of the practice of how these were developed over the years, starting with BPI recommendations, DNV guidance, and the Carbon Trust information. That is what we, we tend to use um, over time today. And from these, we, we end up with um, the depth of lowering, and this is the sort of output that we would typically see from a, um, a zebra form, and it would tend to effectively save the burial effort and the cost where not needed, um, protect against our threats and target areas of high risk and make an optimised um, depth of lowering across the, the length of, of the cable um, to achieve this. And then this will be given to the, the the cable installers for the or with some maybe a factor on for CBA mobility or other other safety factors of where we want to achieve burial um, during the installation campaign. So that is a very brief overview of, of the CBRA, but what we are going to talk about in more detail today is taking that forward into what we're terming the, the CRA, so the Cable Integrity Risk Assessment. Um, the majority of existing offshore facilities have experienced some form of cable pro problems. 83% is a rough is a rough statistic that's been thrown about in the past of insurance payouts for for wind farms related to cable damage. Um, and what we and some of these due to cable faults, but when we're looking at it from the actual cable protection uh, in form of these hazards. Um, we can we we see cable damage can be can be formed from interaction with these and and taking it on from the zebra. Um, over the lifetime of a development, of the state of oil and gas here, cables can become exposed to their burial depth and vary due to method morphology of the seabed. So what we want to look at is forming a, a similar repeatable process to define cable risk and aims to create a management plan for the lifetime of the cables, including the inspection and remediation where required. So looking at what the cable burial actually was, what occurred, 
um, and how we therefore manage the, the integrity of the cable and risk to the cable going forward. Um, there's kind of two times where where we can we can think about doing this one being sort of live during the installation of the cable and directly following to get the risk profile for the cable straight after um, installation and the other being um, during the operational lifetime of the management as things change and updating that risk profile over its lifetime so as I say, those are the two types. So we've got live and post installation um, where we can we can be on the vessel. We can be doing live calculations about what they're actually achieving in terms of installation. And that gives us the possibility to, you know, request reburial passes, multi passes of, of the tool if we haven't quite achieved the burial required um, potential initial remediation activities and confirm reasonable endeavors at the initial phase. Um, remedial rock dump areas can be can be something that is initially discussed at this stage and, and can be taken forward and this basically will confirm the risk profile in comparison to what was predicted or hoped for during the zebra um, and take what actually was achieved and then the remediate the initial remediation from there and this is as I say very important it's very good for for Parts of the reasonable endeavours claim and, and as the cable ins installer and developer proving that you've done everything you can to manage the risk and so far that the discussions that we've had and had with with particular clients is that it's taken on very well by insurers and cable um, people purchasing the, the cable rights such as the Ofto um, for, for further development. And then as the as the wind farm is in operation, wind farm or, or other facilities are in operation over its lifetime, um, things may change, seabed mobility, scour, other increases in traffic, uh, vessel traffic above changes the effect on, on what the, the um, potential for hazards may be. And we can therefore calculate the risk at any point during those following surveys or following if we have more information regarding the depth of burial as we go through and we can use this hopefully over a period of time to predict the potential development of risk and come up with a management plan for, for whatever recommendations for either remediation or potential further survey in certain higher risk areas. The plan for this is that it's repeated and updated following regular surveys and can be part of the overall op operations of management and, and hopefully manage the when the costs are, are used going forward. So the process for this is to initially define the risk using what we know about the sediment mobility, the fishing and the vessel traffic and the total risk there. And then we go on to some other aspects which we'll talk about as we go through this presentation. So what are the typical hazards that we look through? We've got shipping anchors, fishing gear, sediment mobility as a secondary hazard which can cause these problems and on bottom stability where cables can become exposed and and fatigue and, and stability assessments for, for hydrodynamic loading of these cables and where the, the limits of those come in. So one sort of we, in a very similar way to the zebra and these these processes here will be will be um, familiar to some is looking at the the IS data of the shipping and where these occur um, around the routes and taking that forward into a probabilistic assessment and this is done in a very similar way to the zebra and and developing it but what I suppose the the contrary is um, in terms of the zebra is that the depth of lowering is not the output from this as it is in the zebra the the protection the level of protection from from burial is an input into it and we get a risk from it out rather than a what risk we want to achieve and then get a, a depth of lowering out in the zebra and that's what we're looking at here so we will understand what the risk is in terms of a return period for the for the cable um, at the time at which the measurement was was taken of the, of the protection. And one part that changes here a lot is is um, tends to be um, sea bed mobility or move, moving of bed forms. And we can see here from an example at the bottom there where a couple of exposures have come through on a on an interarray cable. We can see the from a comparison of different um, surveys. We can see where we've seen erosion and, and deposits of as the sand waves move across the cable um, which has caused exposures of the cable which was originally buried in the in the first uh, installation phase 
and that's how it changes over the time and what we are looking to to manage the risk of and see at what point is that risk going to be too high for small exposures or larger exposures to actually go forward and remediate big part of this is to understand what is acceptable risk and that comes through a, a discussion with the client and that's sort of the next stage once we understand what the risk is and we can we can say the risk is a level at the current current protection we then have to define what is acceptable risk in terms of what the client requires in discussion with insurers and, and the likes from there and if the if the risk is fine we can do nothing and then just build that into a monitoring plan or if the risk is not fine then we have to think about remediation strategies and going forward so what do we what do we think of as acceptable risk um, often the developers of cable installation packages um, specify a target burial depth and therefore they define the acceptable risk at that point. Um, quite often DNV recommendations for acceptable probability is are based on the pipeline um, protection uh, standard that DNV produce on risk um, and use the, the DNV categories and return periods there. Maybe those aren't as applicable to uh, to um, power cables or, or or the likes that we're seeing i mean loss of production in a in a um oil and gas pipeline could be up to 66 million bar dollars uh, a day and, and you know environmental impacts coming in i mean deep water deep horizon for bp was something of the order of 19 billion um in, in terms of issues so the consequence of of damage is a lot greater but has still has there uh, the same uh, or can be similar sort of operational costs and when we look at the acceptable risk we have the, the typical workflow and we can look at estimated repair costs estimated downtime costs over the chance of the, the the lifetime of the wind farm and come to an agreement with client and insurers of what the um what the acceptable risk uh, may be and what we what we term in the in the kind of process going forward and this is often done in terms of a workshop with the client um, or other stakeholders in this in this necessary talking through what we might we might term as, as acceptable or what we we might want to see in different areas of the of the of the asset going forward. And finally, the, the kind of last stage of the process, and this goes forward if we if we don't have um, uh, if we def decide that the risk is too high or we want to do something about it is to cut more drill down into the details of the aspects of the design and site conditions and what they mean. So we'll look through all the different inputs that are required, including the sort of cost of different remediation options and potential in addition to this would be consenting um, and things like that and environmental conditions of what we're allowed to do. I'm thinking, you know, things like in, in certain parts of the world, you're going to put so much rock dump down and things like that, if that is one of the options that are taken. And that'll be taken forward to try and define what are the best remediation options. Reburial of the cable, external protection, um, restrictions on vessel traffic, or currently do nothing and continue to monitor, which is which is one of the one of the options we have. So to do this, especially in the in the the second type of zero talking about during the operational lifetime, what changes is especially in seabed mobility criteria is sort of the modelling of bed forms and how we how we do this and how we understand what might happen to the cable if a cable becomes exposed due to um, a very mobile sand, is it going to rebury itself? Is it going to then just become unburied? So would any sort of remediation plan we put in place have to consider this and account for what's going to happen? We've got an effect here of, I think, four consecutive um, annual um, surveys or three continuous bathymetric surveys and how the sea, how the seabed is, is moving in that direction away from where the cable initially was during installation and we can see that there's there's the back end of this sand wave is just coming through and going to unbury the cable on the back end of that at some point and we can see that in that critical area there where the green line which is the the cable as as stands is shortly as we progress going to become unburied it may become reburied with these later um peaks and troughs off the back of the main of the, the ripples off the back of the main sand wave um but will it w w at what point will the risk become too high for us to consider and when we move through what will what will be the certain certain time where that occurs and this is sort of a, a very simplistic approach of, of what is happening there as we as the the, the, the sound wave migrates and the cable 
doesn't uh, necessarily move with it, although this is a, a point of, of research at the moment, um, how will that progress? And we can see that in other examples of where cables have become exposed, but the sound wave is moving through and it's likely to rebury the cable. And then maybe maybe it will become unburied again at a later date, a different length of it. And at what point do we necessitate a remediation strategy within that and really understand and become a cost effective plan solution for what we're doing? And again, another example of, of where that occurs and where the cable um movement is is part of the issue as you can see the mean seabed level that during installation follows the cable track and it's buried to whatever depth of lowering was defined under that but as we progress the, the some sound waves have moved through and start to move this the the cable off and, and we can see an area which is likely to become unburied in the short term and how this will affect it and the planning on this and the whether we can predict movement rates um, of the sand waves and when remediation will happen, when the risk may change, helps us plan our, our sort of survey strategy going forward. And then we also, see, so that's one example of, of seabed mobility happening, but rates of uh, scours is also a, a sort of time dependent approach where we can think about this in terms of our remediation management. And if you've got sort of global scour of a site, Repeat surveys can also be used to predict the sort of the rates of these and therefore build that into the management plan of, of when your cable may be at risk in some of the examples we see here. And as an output to those, what we will tend to do initially is is provide the the risk profile of, of a set of cables similar to this in a um, in a traffic light system. Um, so you can see what we what we do in terms of defining the total risk on a trying trying to find that in a in a management system, um, and present that in a, a sort of alignment chart way in here. And we'll see, we'll see again on the next slide how we we try to show this in terms of the cable risk and really provide that as information to the client of where these problems may be. And then that will be taken forward into our remediation planning and whether we do more distinct surveys on certain areas, the higher risk areas and, and how we go forward. And we can present these in terms of sort of alignment charts layout with risk panels, what is going on in terms of the repeat bathymetry, um, how these the change in bathymetry occurs and take that forward. And that will define our remediation strategy and further workshops with clients can, can discuss those in terms of what options are, are available to them and what, what can be done going forward. So the options that we tend to have a remediation when we do see these problems turn up are, are shown here. So we've got sort of remedial burial campaigns, which, as I say, in certain aspects when sound waves may be moving back and forth and the cable likely to be unburied, uh, reburied and then unburied later may not be the best approach to go out and, and do something as as, as costly um, and plan that going forward. Um, we have external protection, which which may be useful in certain areas and, and in terms of mattresses and potential rock dumping as well. Um, and then we have the option to do nothing and just take that forward into, into more surveys um, and where we survey and the duration or, or um, uh, interval, time interval between surveys is, is important to really understand what we've got there. And then the, the final option is just a further liaison with stakeholders. This is all discussing it from how can we protect the cable, but if we can reduce the risk by reducing the potential um, amount of vessels crossing, fishing in that area, other parts, then that can be, can be a way forward as well. So just trying to think about what the best approach is, what possibilities we have in terms of management of that risk of the, to the cable over its long-term thought process. One thing we look at there and, and talk about through, when we, especially when we're talking about those, those sediment mobility movements and, and potential rate movements is using bathymetry or depth of burial surveys of the cable to inform our, our information. But what we're seeing now, um, more and more implemented in these, is using continuous measurements of cables um, in, in installed with, within the installation phase within the cables. And these can be very useful to us and give us a lot of information on whether, how these these um, seabed what happens to the cable, how the, how the mobile seabeds interact and the movement and, and the sort of time dependent nature of them. 
Um, so these continuous measurements is something that you know hopefully we'll see more of going to in um, installation phase and especially in high mobile areas should be considered to be used um, at those at those stages. There's a couple of different areas, direct temperature sensing and direct acoustic sensing that can be used. Direct te temperature sensing gives, you know, you can directly uh, assess the temperature of the cable and that can be correlated to burial depth. And that is something that, that is being discussed um, with a few people at the moment. Acoustic sensing is a bit more simple in terms of depth of burial and is really just looking at when the strain changes for our effects so when the hydrodynamic forces may be applied to the cable so we can think about it in terms of what we're, we're talking about here although the, these applications have a lot different um, uses for what we're talking about here the the DAS system can be thought of as a bit of a binary is it currently buried is it unburied um, to an extent whereas the DTS can give us sort of almost real-time information about what the burial status of the cable is and we can therefore have almost a live management uh, era going forward and, and really use that to drill down on what our remediation strategies are. So that's uh, the sort of conclusion of, of going through it. Um, I just wanted to highlight the process again and really drill down into why we use the the uh the the CRA, especially you know first phase after um installation to really define what the risks are and go forward with initial um risk planning at that point and then when we go into the operation phase using it to really go through and develop remediation management plans and understand the risk and potential remediation and mitigation strategies going forward to try and build to forward the most cost effective and and able solution to achieve a full lifetime risk management of these assets. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to accept any questions in, in the chat or, or my email addresses on the on the window there if anyone would like to get in touch and talk about these um, these aspects. Um, any more points? So thank you very much for your time today and uh, I look forward to the rest of the conference and speaking to you all soon.